morning and welcome to Bridgehampton Presbyterian Church where we continue our sermon series Wilderness Living. And this instalment is titled Bread of Heaven. Join me in a prayer. Gracious God, whose attention to all your children amazes us and surprises us, help us this day to hear your call to us and to accept your direction. Amen. Our scripture lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16 and verses 2 to 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it'll be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining isn't against us, it's against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. And then you'll know, I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a, a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Here ends our reading from God's Word. May God bless it to us. Bread of heaven. I admit it. When I'm hungry, I'm a grouch. Blame it on the blood sugar, blame it on the stomach, sending negative messages to the brain. Blame it on my, I eat, therefore I am, nature. But, and my wife Yvonne will agree with me on this one, and that's not something a husband can always say about a wife. But when I'm not a regular eater, I become a complainer, a big time grouch. Exodus 16, 2 tells us that the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I read that and I'm thinking, I don't blame them. They were hungry. I can high five and say, Amen, to folks with that kind of temperament. I suspect that if I had been there, I'd have been first in line to put my complaint to Moses and Aaron. Now, in a lot of ways, they have a very legitimate complaint. Being slaves under the Pharaoh's repressive regime was no picnic, yet it was preferable to starving to death in a desert. 
Some commentators suggest that the people had forgotten how bad it was in Egypt and point to how nostalgia has a habit of glossing over the bad and making too much of the benefits. But from this stomach's perspective, I beg to disagree. There are times when it's okay to complain. You meet somebody and you ask them, how's things? Oh, they sigh and they say, oh well, I can't complain and even if I did, no one would listen. When people say, I can't complain, sometimes what they really mean is, you wouldn't believe how cruddy life is right now. I'm at my wit's end and I really don't know how I'm going to get through. British people have this off to a fine art. You know the Australians call the British whinging palms? Because some of my fellow country folk have such a reputation for constant moaning and groaning under the guise of saying, hey, everything's okay, don't worry. I think it's in there, the movie about the Griswold's European vacation, that there's a scene where one of the ex Monty Python actors, Eric Idle, gets knocked off his bicycle and then he falls over and then something else bad happens and all the time he just keeps saying, oh no, sorry, no problem, quite all right. Or I think of that scene from Monty Python's Holy Grail movie where the two knights are in combat and after one of them is almost totally dismembered, he says, Oh no, it's just a flesh wound. I've had worse. <laughs> no one likes a complainer. People of all nationalities try and avoid making it look like they're complaining, even when they are. Yet in spite of all that, I maintain there are times when complaining is legitimate. And I think if I were out in the desert with a whole host of people facing starvation without even catching a glimpse of a promised land, I'd feel I had grounds for filing a grievance. <laughs> From a human perspective, it seems that getting mad at Moses and antagonizing Aaron would be justifiable. But, and I hate to say this, from a divine perspective, their complaining was entirely the result of a lack of faith. Their problem wasn't that they'd forgotten how bad it was in Egypt, but rather they had forgotten how good God was in bringing them out from Egypt. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. They failed to remember that this God who had led them into the wilderness had, when they were in Egypt, heard their cries, seen their tears and acted on their behalf. They had lost sight of the fact that God still heard their fears, still saw their plight and was still acting on their behalf. Now, being a disciple of Jesus Christ opens up to us options that are not available to people who don't have faith. Becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ means we have unlocked to our lives a whole spectrum of possibilities. A disciple can, in any given situation, make a choice as to how they will view their circumstances. We can look at life from the human side and find a whole lot to complain about. Or we can look at things from a divine perspective and discover whole areas of life where we are called to exercise trust in God. The community calls Moses and Aaron to account for themselves. What are you doing? Bringing us here to starve. And did you pick up on the answer that they give the people? Mostly, firstly, assures them that by the time evening came around, they would know that the Lord God had led them out of Egypt. And then, Exodus 16, 8, Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, 
What are we? Your complaining isn't against us. It's against the Lord. Now to complain about hunger and express legitimate fears was one thing. God had heard that complaint and God was doing something about it. But to suggest that the whole exodus from Egypt had somehow been the work, not of any divine agent, but to attribute it to Moses and Aaron's hands? That was a big mistake. And it may have been flattering the people considered Moses and Aaron capable of coming up with such a cunning plan. But the dark side of the picture is that it revealed the people had shifted their focus from trusting God to trusting in each other. And one thing's for sure, we can't always be sure about each other. Fact is, we, we make compromises, we forget promises, we lose sight of what God and who God calls us to be, and we need, we need each other's prayers and encouragement because at times our service of God feels like a wilderness and we get hungry for something better and the temptation is always for us to look to each other rather than to God for our needs. When we hear of pastors who fall by the wayside or Christian leaders found guilty of some misdemeanor, we think, how can people called by God turn out to be such rotten apples? Well, Reformed theology suggests that the reason is simply that we are all rotten apples, that aside from the love of God, we are all hopeless cases. And that for all of us, be we pastors, elders, deacons, youngsters, oldsters, rich or poor, male or female, black or white, whether we put our milk in our coffee before we put the coffee in the cup, or whether we prefer to put the coffee in the cup before we put the milk in it, or if we prefer it black with no milk in it, for all of us, the natural inclination, the human side of our lives, is to do anything but serve God and do God's will. You know, Presbyterian doctrine takes grace seriously because it takes sin seriously. <laughs> this reminds me of something someone was alleged to have said. I didn't know what sin was until I met a Presbyterian. In our bulletin, we put our prayer of confession and our words of assurance right near the start of our service. Because we know it, it doesn't take long being in the presence of God to realise we've messed up. And we need God's renewing and forgiving before we can get on with anything else in our lives. Here at church, on Sunday, our final hymn is going to be Guide me, O thy great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. And it contains th that wonderful stanza, Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more, feed me till I want no more. Now over here in America, I'm afraid they don't usually sing this hymn with the same passion as some of their sisters and brothers over in Wales. See, when the Welsh sing that hymn, it builds to a roof-raising climax. The first, feed me till I want no more, is echoed by the tenors and basses, want no more. And that phrase can be held as long as whoever may be leading the singing can stand it before it crashes back down to earth with a resounding and resolute, feed me till I want no more. Not quite what the significance is in that the Welsh seem to sing it as much at rugby games as they do in chapel, I've never really analysed, but I'm of the opinion it's got something to do with the passion and the feeling and the desire to be a winner, whether it be on 
a field of play or the much glamorous, less glamorous game of life. The quails came, the manna came, and the people turned to God in worship and in praise. They stopped complaining and they started rejoicing. And wow, what a change it could make in a person's life if they move from being a complainer to a proclaimer of the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was raised that we might have abundant life and that the Holy Spirit of God can nurture our lives as though we were feeding on bread from heaven. So what's it going to be? Complainer or proclaimer? As a church, what a difference it can make if we can shift our focus from what we can do to what God can do. As a body of God's people, whatever we are, what a difference it can make when we face our challenges, not as cause for complaints, but as opportunities to experience the grace of God. So what's it gonna be? Complainer or proclaimer? Of course we've got bills to pay. Of course we have physical needs. But where are we finding the resources to meet that challenge? Are we making the same mistakes the Israelites did in the wilderness? Trying to find somebody to blame? When actually the problem is, we've lost sight of trusting in God. It's much easier to murmur and complain than take up the challenge of carrying a cross in Jesus' name. There's nothing radical in pretending that everything's all right when there are some things that are wrong and need putting right. I'm not suggesting to anybody that we should put a brave face on things and carry on with this vague hope everything will be all right in the end. What I'm suggesting is that we put our focus as people of faith where it ought to be as Christians that we look to our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So again, what's it going to be? Complainer or proclaimer? And in conclusion, I would remind you of some words recorded for us in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Hear the word of God. Hear that invitation afresh today. Come to me and find satisfaction for your hunger. Hear God's call for us to exercise faith. Believe in me. I will satisfy your thirst. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we are hungry. And we are thirsty for the kind of spiritual experience that satisfies our souls. Too long have we wandered in the wilderness of our own imaginings. For too long have we complained about others' irresponsibility whilst refusing to take responsibility for our own actions. We have too often pretended that everything was just fine when actually there's been a whole lot on our minds and our hearts that has been churning away at us and within us. Your promises are rich. You send the sustenance we need. You provide the bread of life for us to feast upon. You offer us your love in Jesus Christ. You seek to empower us for Christ-like living through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You call us to be daily participants in the life of your kingdom, to be ambassadors of life and truth and love. Lord, we ask that 
You continue to shape and lead and mould our lives according to the riches of your grace. Without you, we have nothing. Without your grace, we would truly be lost in the wilderness, wandering alone. Thank you for those you raise up to lead us, both in church and society. We pray for those in political office that they will seek your ways. We pray for those you have called to lead the people of God, that you would provide them with resources equal to the task and help them equip your people for service in the world. We bring before you all those who have asked for our prayers and those we feel a need to pray for. Many we carry in our hearts, so many different situations of hurt and loss and change and needs that truly can only fully be met by the intervention of your love and the provisions of your grace. If there be any tuning in, Lord, who have a particular need that is upon their hearts, we ask that you hear their cry and meet their need in the way that only you can do lest they be tempted to turn to other things to satisfy their need. Remind them that you alone can ultimately bring satisfaction to the hungry heart and the thirsty soul. For all our prayers we bring in the name and the merit of our one true Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. May the, the bread of life, the very sustenance that God has provided for us in Jesus Christ, may that be our guide and our strength as we go out into the wilderness of this world. But now go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and let the people say, Amen.